welcome everybody to Who's Your Band. We're excited today. We're not we're not going to do any preamble between uh, Sean and I because we're really both excited to have this guy join us. He is the bass player for Anthrax and Helmet, and he's just an all around swell guy. Give it up for our buddy, Mister Frankie Bello. Frankie, hello how are everybody. You? What's going on, boys? We're doing not too much. Frank, not I got to go man. right out of the box here and ask you this question. OK, yep. explain what it's like being a guy from the Bronx playing in not one, but two gigantic bands. I think that is every kid's dream and you are living it. Um, it's it's humbling and I'm grateful. Um, you know, that whole thing, you know, coming from where you come from, everybody comes from somewhere. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. Look, and a lot of hard work. We all know you have to work hard to where you want to get where you want to get to. I'm very fortunate to do this for God. We just celebrated our 40th year anniversary with Anthrax. So um, I'm very fortunate. I know that. I'm very grateful for it. But you got to remember, it's it's a, also a work ethic. Even now, at this stage in my life, I'm 56. It's still a work ethic. You have to get going and really bust your ass to to, to get to that next page, whatever page that is in the band's life. It's uh, and, and your and, and your career really. Did you ever? This is gonna be like no interview you've done before because we are two comics. Number one, great. Number, number now we're also huge music nerds. Okay, great. now we're gonna bounce all over the place. So we have extreme ADD. Number number one. So you. talking about the Bronx, tell me what it was like being a kid from the Bronx and playing Yankee Stadium in 2011 with the Big Four show. Like you had to have worn loose pants because I'm sure like it was just popping out of the front. It had to be like dude, rock hard the whole show. It was, dude, it was because, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story on that. You know, growing up in the Bronx, I grew up 10 minutes from Yankee Stadium as a diehard Yankee fan. You got to remember that. So it's crazy to think you would never think a guy who grew up in, in the Bronx working at my Uncle Joe's Deli in the Bronx. My friends were at Yankee Stadium three, four times a week at, at a time. You know, in, in the 80s, that was crazy stuff. Did you go to so, baseball games in the Bronx? What? You went to baseball games in the Bronx. Oh, nonstop. We used to get the bleacher seats because they were the cheapest. Of course, you sit in the, you know, and you go nuts. So, That's so what you how do. crazy is that? That you were a guy who who went to baseball games and now you people are paying money to see you perform there. It doesn't even exist in your mind when you think, when you pick up a guitar for the first time in your life and say, my dream is to be a rock star or a musician, blah, 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 make money and make a living. Can I do this? All that stuff. You And then, then you know what happens here, guys? You know, you start this career and you get a little successful and you start getting more success. And I'm grateful for all of that. The ride starts, right? Then you think the quintessential place to play as a New Yorker, as as the guy from the Bronx, whatever you want to call it, New Yorker, what's the place you would think? Mass MSG. Square Garden. Madison Square Garden, right? Anthrax, great. We headlined there in Clash of the Titans. It was awesome. It was amazing. I said, this is it. This is it. But then you go forward and you wouldn't, dude, it's not even in your vocabulary that you can play Yankee Stadium. Does, how many bands play number, you know, so Frank, Yankee Stadium? So, Frank, how do you keep it together? How do you keep it up together and do your job? You, you don't, here's what you do. And I'll tell you, let me take you through the day of Yankee Stadium. How about this, guys? I, here goes my, my ADD is going all over the place right now. <laughs> so I'll take you through the day of Yankee Stadium. Number one, it's a shit fest because of the, the tickets, you know, the guest list. Sure. Everybody and their mother hits you up, right? You know. Yeah. You're, you're fucked. Um, so you get so many tickets that you got to chill out. I had six people come out and see me in Buffalo right? this past weekend. What? I had six people come out and see me in Buffalo this weekend. There you go. See? Yeah, I had to put them on the guest list. There, there you go. Yeah, so it's very it, hard, it, yeah. It, it, it's, <laughs> so what happens is, okay, finally, everybody's mad at me for the guest list because nobody can get in. Blah, blah, blah. Nobody's name's there. Blah, blah. So everybody's pissed at me. My whole family's, most of them are pissed at me. My friends, blah, blah, blah. So I, I am, I'm just worried about the fucking show now, right? That we have to actually play the show. During the day, my quest, this was my quest, guys, as a diehard Yankee fan, get there early Make some friends in, you know, the ground crew and stuff like that. Make some friends. You know what I'm talking about? Right. Make some friends. Make, meet the right guy to get me into the Yankee dugout. We did that. Meet the right nice. guy. I wanted to get into the Yankee dugout. I have pictures of this. So I'm sitting in the Yankee dugout. Now, remember, this is a rock show, metal show. So they have the the field covered with, like, you know, plastic, whatever the yeah, shit that the is. The big tops. Yeah, the pit top. The top. So – my only thing, I'm sitting, I'm sitting in Yankee Stadium. I'm sitting in the dugout, Yankee Stadium dugout. And I'm looking, I'm imagining all I can think of. This was my quest. I'm going to fucking dive into second base. I'm doing it. <laughs> I don't fucking care. I don't care. 
matters. It doesn't matter. The problem is security, security, security during watching everything we're doing. Every, do they I know mean, who you are? Time. What? Do they know who you are? Oh, yeah. They don't give a shit, dude. You know, who am I? I'm Frankie from the Bronx. You know, all I'm saying is all of a sudden, so I have this, you know, the, the bar that the, the players hang over when they're yes. watching the game? So my plan is, so I'm thinking this out. I have about 15, I'm in there about 10, 15 minutes now just watching and viewing what I'm going to do. Guys are talking, to, distracting this dude over here that's really watching the fucking field. <laughs> so I'm saying they're having a conversation. All I'm going to do, how am I going to do is I'm going to jump out of the seat. My, my right foot is going to go on that bar, jump onto the field and run reckless abandon. I'm fucking diving into second base. It doesn't matter. I'm doing it, right? What happens, right? It's on. It's the time. He's distracted. Somebody's talking to him. I get up. I hope my left hand grabs that bar, right? I'm about to get my right foot onto that bar. The guy sees me as my right foot is getting onto that bar. The guy yells out like the voice of God. I don't care what band you are or who you are. If you go on that field, you'll be arrested to the fullest extent of the law. No show. That was it for me. And he was serious, ah. dude. This guy scared the shit out of me because all I could think of, if I get arrested before the fucking show, I got to talk to my band every, and the fans, the whole thing just went through my mind. It, it really, it took all the air out. I was just like, ah, because I knew it was true. We've I been to, you know, I've been to like a thousand concerts in my life. And, you know, we went to, we saw, we went last night, me and our, our pro, town coordinator, we saw the life of agony last night. Uh, Where'd they play? LA. Uh, the place in Teaneck, small place, they're doing a small tour. And it was the first, the kickoff show last night. It was like 300 people. Awesome. Yeah. They're doing a bunch of shows. We're going tomorrow night too, but that's another story. But uh, two shows in my life that I truly regret not going to was that show. And when damage plan, when uh, diamond Vinny were playing with damage plan over here in Jersey, uh, it was three days before dime passed away. Right. But right. I will tell you, I did see one of the the most iconic shows that I've ever seen you guys play. And I've seen you guys play probably 20 times or whatever. The New York Steel show. Oh, uh, yeah, dude, that was that was real. That was that, that was, was a heavy, heavy show. And, and to this day, it's it's now what? It's almost 11 years later. Yeah. No. No, more, more than that. Than that. No, than that. 20 years later. 20 years later. Yeah. One of the most iconic shows I've ever seen, Jeff. It was Anthrax, Seb Sebastian Bach, Ace Freely. Twisted Sister. Twisted Sister. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. And oh, right. was it Overkill? Overkill, too. All the New York bands. Eddie Trunk put it together. Um, my friend Eddie Trunk. And I'll tell you, man, you know what the crazy thing about that show was? Look, everybody was feeling it. It was everybody. Everybody yeah. in the world was feeling that. Was going through the crowd. Before the show, and the first responders remember that was the anthrax thing where they remember one of the, the CNN ticker that they wanted us to change our name because the name anthrax. Remember, right, that was a right. deal. Walking through the crowd during that show, and this is a great point. Remember, and I think I put this in the book. Walking through, and the first responders, cops, firemen, EMT people, don't change your name. Don't make yep. them win. It was like a rallying cry, dude. Don't, yeah. they, were, they were insisting, don't change your name. Don't make them win because they felt that if that would be giving up. And yeah. let me tell you something. You want to put a kick in your ass? You get that, man. You go up on that stage, you're ready to rock, man. It really was that that kick in the ass. So we were ready to rage after that because we knew we had it. We had the crowd. It was just – it was one of those those moments in your life. It's like you felt the fucking chills. It was one oh, of yeah. those moments. It was so awesome. Seeing the white, the white suits and then turning around, seeing we're yeah. not changing our name. Yeah, I never heard a pop here. that loud yeah. at a show we're, before. It was unbelievable. Just, it was a time for everybody to say, fuck this. Let's do this, right? Let's, it's, it's like, no, we're, we're coming back. And it was for everybody in that crowd. I thought it was a really important part. Frank, let's go back to walking on stage at Yankee Stadium. I really sure. want to know yeah. what it's like, like to, a kid from the Bronx to walk on that stage, to look out, see – 40, 50,000 people and they're coming to see you. What, what, well, can you describe that? Well, let me take you before it's sound check. I'll do that. Imagine you're in Yankee Stadium. Yankee Stadium, on the stage in Yankee Stadium, the place that I've seen so many games, right? So many fucking incredible, you know. And remember, this is a new stadium, blah, 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 but it's the hollowed ground, so I put that in my head that, you know, it's, it's serious. Um, you you feel this, this point in your life, like – Wow, this is something special that'll be forever. I remember I took a, a picture with my son. That was special because I want him to remember it when we get up, when he gets older. Uh, I just thought 
I thank my grandmother. My grandmother, that was her last show before she passed. Uh, it was the last show she got to see of Charlie Benanti, who's my, my, the drummer of Anthrax. We grew up kind of like as brothers. He's my uncle. We grew up in the same house. And my grandmother was the one who let us be who we wanted to be as musicians. So this was like a kind of thank you. And she was up in the box and um, she was sick, you know, and it was, it was, that's what I remember from Yankee Stadium. So it was like a thank you, Graham. It was, you know, Tina Babe. We call it Tina Babes. It was a big deal for me for that. Uh, and then you talk about talk, walking on the stage. There's nothing like that uh, for me. The garden was amazing. The garden was like, oh my God. But Yankee Stadium was, it was, it was, it was just the massive vibe. It was just a vibe because the New York band, all that stuff. Yeah, we were on. We, were I think you we were nervous? Oh, so we went on. And I just remember the crowd just going fucking ape shit. It was just ape shit. We were going ape shit because we wanted to. <laughs> it was time. It was just letting all this anxiety out. And uh, it was a great show. And everybody remembers it. Everybody remembers it. So it was, um, it was one of those things in life you never think that would happen to a New York band playing Yankee Stadium. Uh, and uh, how about a, a New York thrash band? <laughs> That's yeah. incredible. It's it's, so. sur it's surreal. So this is kind of like a Tarantino movie where we started kind of like in the middle. So let's go to the back a little sure. bit. All right. So yes. you grew up in the Bronx and we're all around the same age. You're like in your, your early uh, 50s, right? Yep. So you, you did you grow up listening to rock, disco, and like, you know, because 70s, 80s, that's what, it was either rock or disco, and that's what you listened to. So what what pushed you into the direction that you went into? Right, it was always rock and roll. And listen, I thought there were a lot of um, R&B groups that were awesome, musician-wise and all that stuff. It was, and disco had some great stuff in it. People made fun of it because it was disco, but there's some great songs. Donna Summer still has one of the best voices you've ever heard. That's the truth. Rest her soul. She's she just, for me, she got stuck in this disco thing, but she had a, she was a beautiful artist. You know, there's Nile, some great Nile talent. Rogers. Great Dude, guy. Of course, <laughs> Nile Rogers. And look, the Bee Gees, for God's sake. The Bee Gees were great before Saturday Night Fever. That's, That's right. just the truth. But <clears throat> aside from that, it was always rock and roll. That, let's face it, guys. That was was on the radio, so that made all the sense in the world. So after after the rock and roll, it was easy to go into the metal thing, man, because it was all it was in more of an aggressive thing. So, so what was the I first felt, record you wind up buying? First rock and roll, Kiss, easily yeah. Kiss Alive. Everybody, right? Kiss what was Alive, it, Just dude. to Kill. Uh, dress the, dress, it was right after that. See, I, I went from Alive and I bought everything after that. I was it. This is it. This is the band that, that was it for me. And of Same. course, the Zeppelins, all that stuff, all the great stuff that was around in those days. And still around. To me, that still is some of the best stuff. <clears throat> now, you grew up with uh, John Tempesta, right? Yeah. And, right? Who plays the drums for the cult. Yeah, we went to, uh, we went to school together. Okay. Uh, high school? Lim Lehman High School. Yeah, we used to jam. Oh, sure. Yeah, Lehman Tigers. Lehman, Lehman High School. And a uh, little tidbit. Johnny and I used to play in the jazz band in Lehman High School. So I used Did to play the stand-up bass. Right. And, and Johnny used to play, it's like regular drums. But what we would do is, and I think I put this in the, this is the story in the book. Um, so the jazz class was like these specific musicians and stuff. I played stand-up. The teacher really didn't like me playing on the electric bass because I, I played hard and it was loud. And I, I used to turn it up to 10. I used to want to hear. So, and she didn't like Johnny on the drums. We used to jam. Uh, we used to jam a lot of metal songs and she didn't like that. So what happened was we would get there, Johnny and I, like 20 minutes, a half an hour early on purpose, just to jam. We cut out of the last class we go in, Johnny and I would sit down and I get on the electric bass and Johnny would get on the drums and we just start playing like Killers from Iron Maiden or some Judas Priest song. Fucking loud, dude. Just And all of a sudden, that was the time the metalheads all of a sudden made this big circle around this headbanging. So it became mm. this thing of two and three rows thick of metalheads. Just, and everybody just getting into it, right? And then my teacher, rest her soul, she was a really sweet lady. She, she'd come in and she see this this loud noise coming out and she pulled this literally pulled the sticks out of Johnny's, Johnny's, um, Johnny's hands and she pulled the plug out of the amp and she just go, out! And she said, right to the principal's hmm. office. I mean, that happened two or three times a week. I'm not even joking. Now, there's something interesting that I, I think I, I, I kind of, you know, per peruse through the book. And when you joined uh, Anthrax at a very early age, you were still in high school. Yeah. Didn't you need your uh, high school principal's permission to leave school a little early so you can go on tour? 
what's great about Lehman High School, um, what happened, they had this great program that I found out. See, I got in the band. I was a 17-year-old guy, right? So I had still a half a year to finish. Uh, Anthrax was going on tour. I got in the band, and they were doing a tour in the second half of the year. I still had a half a year of school. Lehman had this great program where you could double up your credits. So I would start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I finished at 4.30 in the afternoon. I doubled up my credits, and I can get out of early, six months early out of school. So I graduated six months early. So I did that. I got all my credits, and I was able to go on tour with Anthrax. So, I mean, I, I had to just buckle down and get that done because that was my priority. It's like, get in the band. I don't want to leave the band. It made sense. No, but I like that you at least had the, the, the wherewithal to say, hey, I want to at least finish high school as opposed to saying, I'm going to drop out of a high school for this uh, opportunity. Yeah, there was no, there was, for me, there was no choice there. I, I wouldn't have done the band if there's no, for me, my work ethic, I knew I needed a diploma, even if I wanted to go to college, you know, and it's funny because I was looking at colleges and stuff like that. And where, where was I going to go? And I call it now, I went to the College of Anthrax. So it's because it's been nonstop since then. There you go. What would you have majored in? You know, probably not because I, I thought I was a pretty decent baseball player but I when I saw some of the guys play better than me I said I'm not gonna there's no way I can keep up compete with these guys did you play for Lehman? Italian guy what did you play for Lehman I didn't play for Lehman they let, never let me on the team but I was I did well in the in, in Throg's neck and, and that uh their teams but neither here that music was my, my priority at that point anyway it wasn't baseball anymore but uh you know I probably would have majored in um I, I always I've always liked history I've always liked it man I have a, I have a, a master's in history and I did Are it. You because, really? Yeah, because I actually just enjoy it. I like yeah. to read about it. I like to watch history. And yeah, and so I, I do enjoy it. I don't bother because it repeats itself. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, in you, yeah. Jeffrey. <laughs> um, <laughs> how come you and John never formed a band together? Or did you? Yeah, and I don't know about it. Oh, it's right. You guys were in helmet together. We played Johnny, you know, I when um I called a sabbatical. I, I they took a break from anthrax where I needed to take a break from them, they needed to take a break from me. So we decided I'm gonna take a some time off. And I uh John, about two weeks in, Johnny Johnny calls me up because we talk all I still talk to him a couple of times a week. Um he, he calls me up, he said, What are you doing? I said, I'm just getting my head together, dude. I just need a break. He goes, No, you're not, you're coming out to LA. Um helmet needs a bass player, you gotta come and jam. Uh, I said, no, 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 come out. Long story short, I go out to his house, hang out with him. I learned like all these, I, like, I think it was 37 songs for that jam. Uh, and from the first note we played, we knew it was going to work. So, And then we went on tour and we went on tour for a year and a half with Helmet. It was one of the best experiences of my life. I loved it. Hanging out with Johnny every day and those guys in Helmet, uh, Chris and, uh, and Paige, just, uh, it was it was an awesome time. You you grew up listening to, like, it sounds like your background is like, you know, what you listen to is the exact same. Like, my favorite band growing up was Sabbath, you know, mm -hmm. and you love uh, Giza. Uh, you know, two guys I found kind of interesting that you uh, really kind of like are inspired by was Chris Squire yeah. of Yes and Getty Lee of Rush, which Sean hates both bands. Really I do. do. I do. I with a passion. <laughs> really? With a passion. But see, for me, Rush was, it was almost like a learning tool. I loved their songs, number one. And it was like an exercise. Definitely. For me, it was my, my training in bass. Rush, I mean, Rush, um, um, Steve Harris, Iron Maiden, you know, that kind of stuff. Phenomenal. That, that kind of stuff. Um, Giza Butler, Sabbath, that that's like, and now and you talk about Chris Squire, not only was he a great bass player, but listen to the sound of his bass, Chris Squire's bass sound was incredible. It's still, I mean, you listen to those songs now, nobody has that sound. It's How just, did he do that? Well, it's it's just, number one, he plays with a pick, he played, rest of the soul, he played with a pick. Um, but it's just, I mean, he made that sound, that came out of him. You know, everybody tries to emulate that sound. It was right. just a great Rick sound. But long story short, everybody's got their sound. But th that was like when you talk about Rush, Maiden, Sabbath. That was my training. I mean, I didn't go to formal training as a bass player or musician. That was, I mean, I tried a couple of classes, uh, lessons when I first started, but that right. didn't work. And that was, I literally go home and put their LP on and back and forth, nonstop listening until I learned the songs. And that was my training. Be before we go into to more like stories and stuff, uh, you you have the book out 
And the book is called Fathers, Brothers, and Sons, Surviving uh, Anguish, Abandonment, and Anthrax. Shameless um, plug right here. There you go. That's what it looks like. That's Available a great picture, on Amazon by the way. and rarebirdlit.com. <laughs> that is a heavy title. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us, you know, our, our listeners, the abandonment part. I I think it's it's kind of interesting. What motivated you to write this book? Because it's got to be hard. I mean, I guess I have two questions here. I want to know what motivated you to write the book and what's the difference between between you writing a lot of these personal songs that are, you know, that are shorter stories and then putting your whole life on display in a book. Yeah. And being it's, that vulnerable. It's unnerving, uh, to be honest with you. Um, well, maybe write the book. Number one, uh, it's it, Joel, my co-writer, Joel MacGyver. We've been talking about this about eight years, about doing this. My touring schedule, his writing schedule, he, he's a bestseller. He's done a lot of writing, so he's very busy. We This COVID thing, you know, in the lockdown, there's only so much guitar playing and writing you could do and all that stuff. I was okay. in my basement and I'm feeling like, you know, creative and you want to do something. What can I do? And it just came and said, this is the time. I called Joel and I emailed him and it was all meant to be because he was open, I was open. And that next session, the next week after that, it just flowed. It started then and they were just nonstop. We'd, just like we're doing right now. And I jot stuff down, man, uh, ideas. He would, Joel, I know Joel for a long time. He knows a lot of my history. He can just like light a fuse onto one of the stories, like just a line. All it takes sometimes is a line. And I had no idea I even had these stories in my head from way back. And just something just unclogged them. And like, my God, they just kept flowing out. And i be honest with you, dude, to relive them, definitely a lot of pain, especially with my brother stuff and, and abandonment. We're talking abandonment. Living through that stuff again and having to go, to go through it. Because honestly, when we first talked about doing the book, all I said to Joel was, if I'm going to write a book, I want to... I want to be like I'm talking to the to the reader, like I'm having a beer with them at a bar. And that's, thank God for the great reviews, and I'm very fortunate for that. And the people that are reading this and the comments I'm getting, and the letters, they're getting that. They feel like I'm talking to them like a friend, and, and they're connecting with the book, Abandonment, Loss of My Brother. Um, they're connecting with their life story, and they're, they're feeling the same like passion I have for it, and, and how... The main reason to do this book is to make people feel good about things. It's like, how did Frank brush himself off and move on? And kind of, this is my story of how, and that's that's it. It's kind of like paying it forward. It's like, all right, took these beatings, right? Took, took these slap downs in life. Everybody's got trials and tribulations of life. This is my story. You brush yourself off. I have a 15 year old son. I want to teach him how to do this. So I want to say, Brandon, look, yeah, dad, dad took some shots, but if you, you're going to take shots too. This is how you do it. It's like, a, it's like, this is how you do it, Brandon. You brush yourself off and you live for tomorrow. And that's the idea. So people are the, getting that with this book. The book comes across as very conversational yeah. where, you know, where you're just like reciting a story, but, you know, you're not talking down to the reader. That's, yeah. that's, the, that's the impression I got uh, from it. Uh, yeah, no. And again, I, it, it's nice to be, I mean, listen, the stories sometimes are kind of rough. Because, yeah. you know, you, you know, Absolutely. it happened to you, but it's also nice that you're sharing it because there's a lot of this. You can identify with a lot of what went on in your life, you know, and, I, and that, you know, hey, there's somebody else out there. That's a cool guy that, that someone's going to look up and say, hey, you know, I don't have to be ashamed of this. Right. So I really do encourage people to kind of check out this book. It's a Man. great book. Um, speaking Speaking of of you know teaching your son the lessons and 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 brushing yourself off, I want to ask you about something that's kind of going on in the news right now. What yeah. do you think about this whole Joe Rogan Neil Young controversy? Well, I, see, I'm, I'm a big Neil Young fan too, so it's it's tough. Look, everybody everybody's got their opinions on everything, right? And people have big forums to do it and stuff like that. My thing is. I just think people need need to just do their own thing, and uh, honestly, everybody's got their opinions. Like I have mine, you have yours. Why did I? Why does that have to be so vocal? Why can't you just do it on your own? If Neil Neil feels strongly about that, he has the right to pull his music off of there. That's cool, right? Joe is saying his thing. I don't agree with Joe. I don't. I'm just being honest with you. I just don't agree with him. It's fine, but he has his say. But he he's also talking to a lot of people about that. Um, 
again, everybody's got their opinion. But what I'm saying is we're all fucking human at the end of the day. And we, we, some, one of these days, we're all going to have to come together in, in this, on this earth. You know what I mean? One of is these it going to be in our lifetime? In, in, well, we don't know, right? In our lifetime, we don't know. I don't, because it looks so ugly right now. To be honest with you, dude, I'm just tired of people not getting along. I want, I want to bring people together at this point because I'm just tired of seeing people, family members. I mean, I have family members that are fighting and stuff like that. I, come on. Life is this fucking short. I'm just tired of, I'm tired of the, the distance between people. Eventually, we're all going to have to come together. And that's the truth because that's, that's how it's been working all this time. It has to work sometime. So it's true. Yeah. So and, and music is one of those things that does bring people together. I mean, Mike, Mike will tell you, we were at that show last night, Life of Agony. And the cool thing about it is, like, it's a band I've seen for 20 years. And last night, I paid $5 extra to have a seat so I wouldn't have to be in the pit <laughs> because I don't want to have people around me. And there was no pit. And then I realized, hey, everybody's 50 years old. This is the great thing. Yeah. But again, it was a great feeling in there and go, going to see a show and, and feeling the music that you love. It, it, it just, there's nothing better. There's absolutely yeah. nothing better than that. So I, for, for me, I don't want to separate people. I want people to be together. I want our fans, whatever you feel, man, I want them all together. I want to be together with people. Everybody's got their opinions. You live your life. I'll live my life. That's the way I feel about things. But, a- and, but what, what I am, I, I just want to see the fighting stop and people just separating like that. Cause eventually look that it's been working a long time when people are together, you know, I want to see mm-hmm. all forms of people at, at the shows music. Like you just said, dude, I totally agree with you. Music is a, is a great reason to get together. So, you know, again, people have big forms. That's fine. That they'll, they'll say what they say, but um, I, I think eventually we're all going to have to come together. There's two bands that I always talk about is Van Halen and Anthrax. And I talk about it for one reason is the fact that the original singer leaves and you have a second singer coming in and it changes the sound of the band drastically. Wow. Now I was a little too young when, when David Lee Roth left Van Halen, I was probably around, I don't know, maybe 10 or so, but I was a huge music nerd. So I knew there was a new guy coming in and I had known Sammy Hagar stuff. And I even knew at that point that, the sound of the band was different. So now Joey leaves Anthrax and you bring John Bush in and it's a completely different band. I agree. Completely different band. The one question that I have about this is that why are you not playing any Bush era songs live? Because there's a huge, uh, to be honest with you, dude, it's a huge catalog with Belladonna with Joey Mm -hmm. Belladonna. And we can't even get to those songs. Believe me, I would love to play John Bush songs, Joey Belladonna, I, because I'm very, I feel very lucky and fortunate to be in this band because I think we had two great bands at that time. You know, we had the just completely different, just exactly. completely different. And I love both eras of that of that band, of the, the Belladonna and the Bush era. So I would love to play it, but Joey has his songs he wants to sing. John has a, there's a whole catalog of John I would love to do. That's just the way it is now. And plus, now we're writing new music. So how do you fit that in with the catalog? I mean, that's it's a good problem to have. Believe me, I'm very we're very fortunate you to do have a that four problem. hour show. Yeah, so it is what it is. It'll be what it is, and and who knows about the future? By the way, are we ever going to hear? That, are we ever going to hear that lost record that I've been hearing about forever? What lost record? Which one are you talking about? Didn't you have another singer that came in and you were recording with another guy from Long Island, I believe, before oh. Joey came back into the band? No. I mean, we, I mean, there's other things I can't talk about legally, just so you know. Legally, I can't talk about that. That's probably what I'm talking about. So yeah, yeah. let's just skip over that then and let's just have a toast. We'll edit that part out. No, it's totally it's nothing fine. bad. Nothing bad. It's all legal and stuff. I just can't talk about it legally. I'm, I can't. Understood. I can't talk about it yet. Understood. Let's talk about something else in, uh, that goes on in your life, uh, Joe. Uh, from Joe, Frankie. Uh, you call me Joe. Uh, <laughs> my grandma, you call good, me Joe. I'm thinking of Joey Bell. Uh, yeah. Don, but um, you did some acting. Are you still yeah. doing any acting? Do yeah. any projects? Yeah. You know, when it comes around, I mean, it's, it's COVID time, everybody. Yeah. So, you know, the auditions are on tape now. So it's, it's fun. Yeah. But I, I still, when, when they, the agent calls, my, my agent calls me up, I get on tape and I put it on. I did one last week. I haven't heard anything. So I guess I didn't get that one. But what yeah. kind of roles do you go out for? Uh, mostly dramatic, mostly dramatic stuff. And um, last, last week, I, I read for a Sly Stallone film that's going to be on, uh, not a film, a TV show that it's going to be on Hulu. So, um, oh. but I heard a, a, a really big star and came in and took the part that I wanted to read for, uh, that I read for. So I guess he's going to, he's a much bigger star. 
So you know, when I love a band, I, I like when, when the bands, um, you know, go for a break or whatever, and some of the artists decide to do a solo project or a side project, I'm always going to support that. Thank and you. one one of the ones I loved is Altitudes and Attitude. Dude, thank you, man. Wow. Where did that, where did that start from? Dave and I, Dave Ellison and I, uh, my friend, longtime friend, used to play me- bass in Megadeth. Um, we did a lot of bass clinics for the, uh, our bass company, Hardkey. Um, and we would do a jam. We do dual dual bass jams. And we come out at the end of the, we do our individual shows. And then at the end of it, we come back and jam some stuff. We just started looking at this and say, why don't we jam some songs? Why don't we write some songs to do at the end of these things? Long story short, that became... I had songs, he had songs, we put them together and it became, it be, it became like a band and him and I just had a ball with that thing. And thankfully a lot of, and thank you for that. A lot of people like that. Um, and I loved forward, it. Thank I appreciate that. So I took the mic with it. It was fun. It was fun to get that stuff out. No pun intended. I was naming the record, get it out. Um, and you know, I, for the book, funny enough, um, during this book, I wrote a bunch of songs that have to do with this everything that was going through my head. So I'm going to put some solo stuff out eventually. It's really, it's like a continuation of Altitudes and Attitudes. So people are always asking me about the next Altitudes and Attitude. The stuff I'll be putting out is really kind of like what I would have had for the Altitudes and Attitude. So it's, it would be the next one. So Different vibe too, which I kind of like, because a lot of people will go in and start a side project and it's, it's very similar to the original. This was like a great, I'm not going to say pop rock, but it was a, a lighter rock sound, which I thought was yeah. fucking killer. It's just hook, hook stuff, you know, yeah. hooks, book choruses and stuff like that. And then that's what stuff we're into. And, and that's the, the fun stuff. I don't want to, you can, I mean, I write with Anthrax, so that's for Anthrax, you know. Yeah. And this was a completely separate thing that I, I had these songs. I said, this this would be interesting to see what, what people think of this. And I, I, it, I still have fun with it. Is it hard being in two bands? Because when you're right, like, do you, do you give like the good stuff? to like your primary band or do you hold back because you want to hold it for a, a solo project or a different project? No, because you write like, for, for instance, Anthrax and Altitudes and Attitude, two completely different sounding bands. There's a riff that would be, or a part of a strong st- structure that you know was Anthrax. It's like, oh no, I got to save this for that. I'll bring it to the guys and see if they like it here. And there's other stuff, Altitudes and Attitude or my solo stuff. Oh, that's definitely a solo solo track. That's for That's for me, you know? Um, but yeah, whatever, it'd always be first, if it's a heavier vibe, it's a heavier vibe. I'll always give it to Anthrax and see if they like it. And if if people want want to work with it, that's how we work. If people like the songs and, you know, we'll put it in. Do you remember when you first started out, uh, playing clubs like Lamaze? Um, what was the difference between the New York rock scene, like Lemoore's and, you know, I grew up on Staten Island. So, you know, it, it would be like uh, the, the rock palace and the factory and then sure. going and the Jersey uh, clubs. What was, what, was the, what was the difference between the scene here on the East coast? And did you get a chance to experience uh, the sunset strip vibe? Yeah, I did. I, I did. You know, because I remember anthrax when we started, that was the whole thing. We went, we, we got over there in the eighties. It was crazy. But Lemoore's remember, the Wars was my first show. That's right. And first, isn't it on, don't you have it on tape? Like if, if anyone wants to go and check it out on YouTube now, could they YouTube. do that? You see, you see the short hair Guido Frank Bello. <laughs> That's right. And his first That's show right. and um, head banging. And you, you know, I, I say this in the book about that first show and bringing you through it. I remember I was so fucking nervous because it's my first show. I'm literally coming out of my room in the Bronx and this is my first show ever in any band. My first band, first show, you know, first everything, fucking packed fucking Lemoore's place, right? I'm it, shitting my pants, right? It was great. It was always great. It was it was awesome. So I put my, all I said to myself, if I fuck up, I fuck up. I'm just going to put my head down and head bang. So what I did, the first song, Death Ride, I remember, man, I'm, I say this in the book, I'm fucking head banging. I'm really over, overdoing it because I'm <laughs> overcompensating. I, I, did, I, I swear, I thought I snapped my neck because I felt this, I heard, a, I heard like a, as I'm playing, I heard, I heard like, what the fuck was it? And then all of a sudden this burn, this fucking burn in the back of my neck. I thought I fucking, I said, oh my God, please, let me just finish the show. Then I'll go to the hospital. I was just trying to talk myself into it. <laughs> Thank God it went away after two or three songs. I was so fucking, because it, it was burning me, man. Uh, but that was my first show. I'll never forget that because of that 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 click I heard. Yeah, you look like Graham Bonnet. <laughs> That's awesome. Do you I ever think, like, going back to that first show, like, 
ah, I'm going to do this for 40 years. No. You know, I, I remember I have a, I have a very, very dear friend of mine and uh, she was part of like that scene in the very early, like she was engaged to a Billy Milano for a long time. So I can remember moving her and she goes, I have a bag of these shirts and I don't know what to do with them. And she goes, I'm going to throw them away. And she pulls it out and it was an anthrax shirt. And she goes, these were like hand drawn. I'm like, if you fucking throw that shirt away, I'm going to punch you in the face. And I've never hit a woman in my entire life. <laughs> And like, I'm, I, I remember this and I'm saying to myself, like, this is like history. Yeah. Just these, these things are just history. Like I can't imagine, like I I'm doing this podcast with Jeff for like two years now. There's no fucking way I'm ever making 40 years of this prick. I'm telling you right now, this is probably <laughs> the last episode. 40 more years. This is probably the last episode. Anyway. You say that now, but we don't look, here's what you do. You don't look, you just do. Right, right? right. You just do. And all of a sudden the years start piling up. I can't believe I've been in this band. I honestly dude, And you guys probably feel like this. I don't feel like I'm in the age I am. I'm still immature and definitely in my head. Yeah. But the body creaks it out and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, that 40 years went like this. I mean, I remember the first Lamore show. I still remember that. So for me, um, I, I don't see it like that. I, like You can't say, oh, I'm going to do this for 40 years. All I wanted to is make the next, I would hope to God that I could play another record or I can go on a tour. That's how you take baby steps and see what's next. And then when the snowball starts going and you, you ride it out and see how long, honestly, all you do, if you stay honest with it, like you, you're a comedian, you get it. You stay honest with it, right? Yep. You, you understand you stay honest with it and it'll lead you to the next day. That's what happens. You what is your moment. favorite, you what is your favorite record that you've done? And what is your least favorite record that you've done and reasons for both? Well, they're, they're all your babies. Um, yep. that's what happens as, as your jokes are, right? They're all, you, you could think it's the best fucking joke in the world, but it may not land well, right? Oh. The same, it sucks, right? Yeah. But the same thing with records. You could, you could have the best fucking record in the world. You think, right? May not land well. My first, my first record with Anthrax spreading the disease that I played on a lot of memories for me, um, coming, coming of age. I was always, all of a sudden I was a professional musician being on a, a major record label, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That was very special to me. So that'll always be special. And I don't have um, a one that I don't, I don't like. I don't, the one I, I wish we had a little more time with was State of Euphoria. <laughs> I wish we digested that record a little bit more and had more time, but we were in a, in a pinch of time and we had to go on tour. So we, we should have lived with some, just a couple of those songs a little bit more. <laughs> Frankie, do you still enjoy touring? I do. I wish I could do it. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, um, I can't wait to get on the stage. And, you know, Anthrax played nine shows, festivals last year, uh, festival shows periodically throughout the year. Uh, and you know that after doing it this long, the one thing you miss, and you guys will know this, because uh, when you, just like a comedian, you want to do that next show and, and get better. Whatever you did, you want to up that, right? Um, when you leave a stage, you, I, sometimes I had another month to the next show. And that was nine shows. Wow. And so I can't wait. I can't wait to do a tour where you, you have a show the next night and get it to do this amazing thing that I've been blessed to do again and make people feel good and get this angst out of me and them and, and have this vibe together. That's what it's about, man. We all know. Same thing with oh, community. Yeah. So I always think that there's a huge connection between music and comedy. Absolutely. And and the reason why is because, you know, we're going up there giving you our craft for the simple reasons of number one, we love doing it. And number yep. two, we love the reaction that the people are giving us. Yeah. And I it's always funny. feel like most comics want to be musicians. And there's so many guys, the musicians want to be comics, too. Absolutely. And then because we we ball bust, ball busting is a lot to do with it. Right. That's what happens. Yeah. But you know what? You build as as you do the comedy on stage, you're building a reaction and you build an energy together, right? And yep. that that energy from the crowd, the comedian, you have this one great vibe. And that's what it, the same thing with music. You have this, you're putting out songs, they're enjoying it. You get this one big vibe and it is that energy in the air that we're all craving. That's exactly what happens, man. And that's what we crave. We want to do more of it because of that. We want that high. Do you still have the energy to tour the way you did, say, 20 years ago? Because you see, like a no. band, not, not that you're as old as the Stones, but the Stones <laughs> are like, you know, but they're doing, they're touring, but they're doing two shows a week. Like, do you, do you feel like you guys at this point have to pull back a little bit because you do put so much energy into a show? 
Well, we're in the position that we could do. We're not like Metallica where we we can pick and choose, but we have to do a periodic tour. Like we won't do more than four or five weeks at a at a time. You can't because then it just doesn't make sense. We'll do strategically the right places to play and hit the biggest markets. That's the way to do it nowadays because you can't look. We all have families. We all have kids growing up. Nobody wants to miss that. And let's face it, it, it beats the shit out of you. And we have a pretty lively, active show, Anthrax. So right. this stuff beats the shit out of you very well. So after five weeks, you just want to go home, take a breath, recoup, and then go back. And you no, know, two weeks later, you want to go. But I can't wait to go fucking go again. You know. Who are some of the newer bands? Do you listen to? Do you like Greta Van Fleet? No. <laughs> Thank you, God, Frank. Thank you. I was leading. I was Thank leading you. you down a path. I was leading you down a path. Now you can lead me down the path. I'm just not a fan. I mean, <sighs> I, I, good. to what the people are like it, that's cool. Just the musicians of that band are good. I mean, that's for but, you. But uh, I'm just not a fan. I tried to be, and now I'm just being honest. Nothing. Look, there's nothing wrong with them. The, the talented guys. I'm not saying anything bad. Oh, you're it's my favorite guest I've ever had on this show. You have no idea. <laughs> who do you like out of the newer bands? Who do you like? Like um, Hailstorm. Of course, I, they're, they're great guys. We've to, we play with them a lot. You know what's great about touring? You get to see the newer bands come up. That's what I miss about touring. Also, you know, you can't you can't get what's on. You know, have you heard? You guys heard of a band called Crowbot? Oh God, yeah, I love Crowbot. Crowbot, I, I actually wrote a song band. with them a couple of years ago. It was awesome. So yeah, th- there's some great bands coming up. You know, I just had to cancel off of the the sto- you know the, the Ship Rock show. There's a there's a cruise called Ship Rock. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was supposed to be doing it, but I had to cancel because my doctor insisted. <laughs> because <laughs> the obvious, I have, a, I have an autoimmune thing. So she said, oh, you're not going on that thing. So long story short, uh, I would have saw a lot of new bands on that thing too. I'm always looking, you know, always yeah, looking. I, you, I think the loudest show I ever went to in my life was you and Motorhead. Motorhead. That's a great show. Love I mean, I, 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 I think I have tinnitus in my ears. <laughs> not from my shitty guitar player who cranked it up to 13 all the time, but I think it's just from that show. Motorhead, uh, always great, always loud, and I loved every second. And we toured so much with Motorhead, oh, so sorry. much. Um, and definitely, I lost some hearing from that, which is part of the game. Oh, yeah. I, we, I used to stalk Lemmy at the Rainbow. Oh, yeah. Just He's because I, I was dying to meet him. I would, And yeah. I never got to. But I would sit I would sit at the, at the video poker machine and just see his name popping up on the video poker. And it was just one yeah. of the coolest things I ever saw in my life. You would do it we everywhere. Went to, uh, we went to his grave to, just to pay respect. We brought him a Jack and Coke at the grave. And then we're walking out. And I see this gigantic, gaudy, like, crypt. And I'm like, I don't know who the hell that is. But I know it's Italian, right? And I walk up. And it's Ronnie James Dio. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Another, Fucking amazing. Another from my heart. It's the best. I got to meet Lemmy backstage. Listen to this lineup. Ozzy was headlining. Middling was Ugly Kid Joe. Remember them? Of course. And one of, one right. of my favorite underrated bands. I actually just played Menace to Sobriety today. The whole way through. Kidding? Maybe three hours ago. <laughs> and then, then the opening act oh. was Motorhead. And Lemmy was just miserable. Really? Oh yeah, I, you know, I, I was talking to him in in the dressing room. He was, it was, just, it was just like unhappy. Did not want, was, did not want to be there. It was really? in New Jersey at the Meadowlands. Yep, I love Lemmy, man. We we've had so many great stories. You know, I, I have this one story. On, uh, you guys probably don't know this yet. I have this one story in the book that's one of my favorite times of all the touring we've done with them. You know, we get we play with Motorhead a lot. We were in Europe. And uh, I used to, for sound check for Motorhead, I used to watch them every day. You know, the monitor board on the side, you know, you could just watch from the monitor board. I would stand on the side of the stage uh, at the monitor board with the monitor guy, just watching what Lemmy would do. Cause I'm a student of bass. I just want to watch what he, how he played, what he did and you know, the tenacity of it all. He was awesome. So I just be studying and just like watching everything, his vocal, everything he did, sound. So I'm just watching him headbang, you know, at, and he stops, you know, so the song ends and he looks at me, come here, dude, I was fucking, I, I know that, I mean, I've, I've talked with him before. He's great. I mean, if I was intimidated, I was, cause he goes, come here. I'm like, oh shit, what did I do? What did I do? So I walk over there very gingerly to the stage. It's like four or five feet, right? Right to him. Picks, takes off his bass, dude. Puts it on me, right? Points towards his amp. He goes, go. Just like that. I say this, this is a story in the book, right? So I'm fucking freaking the fuck out, right? And there's nobody else playing. It's just Frank, right? With the bass, his tech and, you know, martial amps fucking raging, right? 
I turn this thing up. I equate it to, you ever see Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox? Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I know, I know you're going the with opening this. Scene? Yep. yep. Dude, so I hit this fucking E chord on the bass. I just, dude, boom. I mean, it's like a punch in the fucking face. This thing, two, three steps back. What the fuck? And I, all of a sudden, I look over to Levy. He's like, hey, hey, hey. he just knew exactly what he was doing, dude. That's great. One of my favorite documentaries is the Lemmy documentary that they put out, I guess, about six, seven years ago. And I I love when he was talking about, I think it was, it was a story or something like he was, uh, you guys were in a studio or something and Scott was wearing some kind of shorts and he's like, those aren't shorts. And he comes out and he wears these little tiny denim shorts where his like balls are hanging out of the back of him. These are shorts. It was so great, man. He used to be playing pinball with them. We were in a rehearsal studio and he'd be wearing them, these, 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 these poles, man. It was, they were just short. It was just awesome. It was so Lemmy, man. He was, yeah. he was a class A guy. I loved him. You know, he, he was very to himself with that stuff, but he had a great personality too. You know, he, he, he had this, 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 this image, but he was a really good guy. He really was. Great what does the future guy. hold for, for you and, and Anthrax? What, you know, we're early in 2022. What do you guys have on the books and what do, you, what do people have to look forward to? Uh, we have a tour book, believe this thing called tour. We have a tour booked for September, October, European, full on tour. I can't believe it. I'm hoping there's no more variants, right? Um, and God willing, that'll happen. And uh, we're writing a record as we speak and uh, hopefully come out with a record and uh, make it all happen again and move on with our lives. But that's eight months from now. Yeah. Eight, nine months from now. What, what are you doing in between? Writing, promoting my book. Oh, shameless plug right there. Uh, and I'm also, I wrote some, like I was talking about before, I wrote some songs. I have some songs recorded that when the paperback for this book comes out, we might release it around the same time. I'm hoping that works. You do a combo thing with the CD built into the book. I'm hoping, yeah. So it's up to the, the publisher and I'm hoping they're, I think they're deciding on that right now or what they want to do. That's I'm, very cool. I'm into it at all. It's all good. Now, with with stand up, it feels like if you don't go uh, two days without doing it, three a week feels like an eternity. Yeah, mm-hmm. you feel you feel very very rusty. Is, is that the way you, you feel as well? I mean, if you have like these huge layoffs, do you feel kind of rusty going back up, and it takes a little while to kind of build it back up. Our first show back, I felt like that. I was I never had butterflies. Uh, I was wor- more worried about my body. As much as I do yoga and all the shit I do. I was worried about not uh, being in shape. Two songs in, I was fine, just like a comedian. Once you get that laugh, you're fine, right? You get that that vibe, then you start rolling. It's really, I equated. It's really, they're really similar. So it is like that. So I just look forward to doing what we do. I want to get back to the music scene, getting back to being uh, bands, crowds, the whole thing where everybody feels safe. It's a good vibe. We'll see. It was yoga part of your daily routine. Yeah, has to be. I'm, dude, my back is shot after all these years. Like I have a lower disc issue with sciatic thing. And if I don't do these specific things, it just doesn't work. And I'm, I'm thankful I could do this because I literally get the pad out every day and, and make it happen. And Jeff, Jeff's going to laugh at this because I, look, I'm, with the backstory is I'm 6'3", about 350. Wow. But I was 6'3", and I was about 460 at one point. Wow, and I God lost bless, all the man. weight. I, I lost it from doing yoga. It really wow. is an amazing, I dropped like 90 pounds in six months. God bless doing yoga. That's awesome. it's, a life, it's a life-changing thing. It really is. People, it has a bad stigma. It's like, ah, oh, it's this, this fucking housewife who uh, dropped the kids yeah. off at school. She got her latte and she's going yeah. there and she's stretching and then she's fucking the instructor, you know, all that kind of shit. But it is a life-changing thing. It really is. It really is for anybody. And look, it's good for your head too. It helps my head. You know what I mean? To get sure. clears me out. So look, between that and this is look. This is along the path. I learned all this shit along the path. You, you have a life. You learn. Yoga gets my ass into shape. Gets my head in shape. You know, just just thought process. You know, meditation. You know, uh, it's. It, I, I study TM. You know, transcendental mm-hmm. meditation. It's it's important because I need that because all my, my my fucking head goes out that way. So you learn these little things to plug in to make it work, and that's uh, that's what life's about. Oh, yeah. dude, listen, I, I'm imploring Jeff to do it because, look, you guys are the same age. You're in fantastic shape, and Jeff's a fucking lump. <laughs> he's, a sca- he's a scallop with feet. It's fucking horrible. You know what? It's funny because once you start it, you start it, then you realize what it makes you feel like. And it does. It really works. It elongates shit, makes stuff feel good again. That's what the whole point is. It makes yep. it feel good again. John, you lost 60 pounds? It's amazing. No, I lost 120 pounds. Where'd you drop it from your belly to your ass? Where did, where did it go? 
Jeff, here's the thing. What you do is when you're a big guy, you buy the bigger clothes. So that way you don't see the massive girth that's hanging over your crotch. So then what you do is when you drop the weight, you buy a lot skinnier clothes and it makes you look a lot smaller. I've lost six pounds in three years. <laughs> I stick to a mostly cake and pizza diet. That that I find kind of works for me. You know, that, that's, that's what I'm trying to to, to work. It, oh, man. But yeah, you, you look good. Did anyone ever tell you this, Frankie, that you kind of look like a little bit like Billy Squire? Really? No, uh, that's a new one. You never yeah, I've, 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 I've met Billy. He was a great dude. Great I'm guy. a big Billy Squire fan. I met him in the, in the, at the winery in the city. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great place. He, yeah. He did, that, he did a show with him, um, with a little show, just him and a guitar player. It was awesome. It's awesome, man. I met him at the um, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction dinner. I forgot what, what year it was, but it, when it was at the Waldorf, yeah, you know, before they kind of like moved in. Yeah, he was he was really cool. Um, remember, he had this huge career Dude. in like the eighties. And w- was it? Would you say it was that video that really killed him? No doubt, because "Take Me in Your Arms" wasn't it? "Take Me uh, Love Me Tonight." What was Rock the name? Me of that? Rock Me Tonight. Right, that's it. Um, still a good song, just <laughs> an unfortunate video. Oh man, he, I mean, he came one of the first shows I saw was like Skid Row, like Billy Squire, and Bon Jovi. Yeah, at, that's a at good Giant, show. Sta- at giant Stadium. That? It was the New Jersey tour, so it had to be like '88 or '89. Oh, Skid Row was on. was on that show. He was the middle act. The wow. Skid Row had just put the first album out, so he was the middle act. I, didn't I can remember he... going like no. I knew two songs, like thirteen. You know what I mean? But like I'd wow. Skid Row, I'm singing the whole fucking record. You of know? course, of course. But yeah, he man, had a wow. string. Of of hits, I remember he was support for Queen on the Hot Space tour, and wow. Hot Space was a terrible album by Queen. It's probably the worst. And Billy Squire had put out, I think, Emotions in Motion, yeah. which was a great album. Yeah, absolutely underrated. And- Billy Squire is underrated, dude. I saw him. With, I saw him with another band called Piper way before. Dude, I was before. just about to go there. Was your first concert Kiss? Yes. Kiss. At Madison Square Garden, December sixteenth, Piper opened opened up the show. That wasn't and- my that wasn't my first show, but I was at that show. My first show was at the Coliseum, Nassau Coliseum. Kiss seventy six. Do you know whose first show? Uh, uh, that's it. First show was Eddie Trunk. Was it really? Yep. Uh, I didn't know that. How yeah, many before. fucking times I've heard about this goddamn concert, Frank, <laughs> over the last two years? <laughs> I love fucking I Piper. Loved- and fucking White Tiger and all these goddamn bands that Jeff grew up with. Do you remember with. these bands, Frank? Of course, man. That was the scene. Come on. We God all damn it, that. Frank. Come on. You had you had Prophet. You yeah. had um, Zebra, who was Zebra. a great, great three-piece Tell piece me what band. you want. I remember, of course. Yeah, sure, yeah. man. Yeah. So that had, was it just as cool for you to play Lamores? And like, and like a young guy. Like how many chicks were you getting uh, doing these shows and being I, in a You band? know, it's funny because I wasn't, I wasn't. I was more focused than music. So they they were there, uh, and I, I I always felt like when I was younger, I can't be distracted because I saw my friends get girlfriends and them like they got pulled out of the scene, and I always thought it was important to focus. Yeah, I mean, I had girls girlfriends and stuff like that, but I didn't make that a um, a thing that I had to do. I had to learn. I had to learn how to be a better bass player. That was important in a songwriter. You. This is the second time you mentioned that, and if. It's another quality that I'm kind of impressed with with you. Where did you get your discipline from? Where you're such a young kid and anyone would be influenced by that. But yet you said, no, I can't let this sway me. You know, I have the bigger picture in mind. Where, did, where does that come from in you? Abandonment. <laughs> Abandonment. Honestly, dude, it's about work ethic and learning. Nobody hands you anything. Nobody in this life fucking hands you anything. You guys as comedians, you guys know this. Nobody fucking says you're playing this great gig tonight, opening for this great star, blah, blah, blah. Nobody does that. You have to earn it. And I learned that at an early age because nobody handed me, look, it's a lot of work. And every and everything you want to do, look, co- comedy, music, whatever, acting, whatever you want to do, it's a fucking lot of work. If you don't put the time in, you, you know what? If you don't put the time in, do you deserve it? Think about it. Because, uh, you know, I, I want to be, I want to feel good about what I did, you know? I want to feel good that, yeah, I put the time in, then, yeah. And it's just why I say, all right, you deserve this. Don't get too crazy with it because you have to work hard again. And that's the way it is. Keep it going, man. I, even right now, dude, 56, I know how hard we have to work for the next record, for the next cycle. You have to because you're cheating yourself if you're not. You, you can't cheat the fans. You can't do that shit. It's got to be all or nothing. It's got to be. If it stopped today, 
would you be happy? No. No. That's what I, I want to hear. No, because I have more to do, dude. I have, you know, because I have a lot more to say and the world needs music and I love metal. I love rock. I, you know, I love touring and I love making people feel good. That's the truth. And uh, if music does that, I want to do that. I got to say, I think it's easier said than done. And, you know, I don't know if you're giving yourself enough credit because, you know, Sean's heard this a million times from me, but, you know, one of the first jobs I had, I worked A&R uh, for uh CBS records. I used to go out and see tons of bands, you know, you would see all these talented musicians and like how many people just kind of fell by the wayside. Yet you're a guy who's, and, and the same thing in comedy. How many sure. times have you seen these great comedians get caught up in drugs, in, in, in girls and just not putting in the work and then make an excuse why it never happened for them. I agree. You know what? And it takes, think about it. It takes a lot of luck too in this business, in any business, any, especially show business, let's face it. But imagine when that luck, if it happens to come along in your life, if you weren't working hard and getting your chops up and being That's ready right. for that fucking That's moment, it. then then you got to then you got to really kick yourself in the ass. When the moment came, you were ready and you were prepared for it. Well, I got lucky. I, I, I know. I, but I, what I did know, I had the confidence that I knew my shit. That's the that's the truth. I knew I worked I worked hard and I would continue working hard. So yeah, there's a lot of luck involved with that. When you get the opportunity, you better take advantage of it. You're a very impressive guy, Frankie Bello. Oh, dude, Sean, then, you want to ask uh, your famous question? You're a bass player. You also yeah. sing. Now, if yeah. you could pick your ultimate band that you want to put together, doesn't yeah. have to be anybody in Anthrax. No. What's the band? Living or dead? Oof. Wow. Great. Living dead. Wow. Living or dead. I want Bonham on the drums. Okay. Right. Um, God, that's tough with the bass thing though, man. That's because you're a fucking bass player, Frank. Play the fucking bass. I got to play. All right. I I, got to play. I'll play bass. Damn it. Um, I want Hendrix on guitar. I want, I, cause I just want to feel that vibe, you know, and God, who's singing for him. That's a tough one. How about, Oh dude. That's a really hard one. How about Dickinson? I love Dickinson, but you talk about live or dead. I love him. But if you're giving me the option for anybody past, I want to sing. I want to sing. I want to play on a stage with Freddie Mercury. Ah, that's that's let, me, let me tell you something. Two years I'm asking this goddamn question. That's the best fucking band anybody's ever put together. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand. I, I'm asking these people and they're like, uh, you know, there's a lot of great musicians, but I just love my band so much. So it would have to be my band. And it would make my fucking blood boil every right. time. Give me, give I've me said it a million band. times. If I could be in any band, I'm playing rhythm guitar for Guns N' Roses, period. That's it. You're great. That's a great band. Absolutely. I don't blame I don't want to be Slash. I don't want to be Axel. I want to be yeah. the guy hanging to the side, playing a little bit. That's all I want. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So for me, imagine jamming with Hendrix, Freddie taking the vocals, being the showman that he is, bottom on drums. My God, what do we got going there? You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. And you're like one of my favorite bass players. And I'm not knocking Thank you me. by saying this, but you're like uh, on, the, on the bottom in that, in that group. Absolutely. Dude, I'm happy to be on the bottom there. Happy <laughs> to be watching because I'll be the fan. Remember, I'll never stop being a fan of this stuff. We're it's how lucky great, am I to be in the uh, being a musician? You know, That's you where say this. Passion comes from. We're lucky to do this, dude. I know. How, I'm very. I'm thanking God for it. Right? Maybe I'll make a living with this stuff. It's crazy, but I want to enjoy it. Imagine being on that stage. I'm seeing Freddie in the front. I got Bottom behind me. I got Hendrix wailing, dude. I'm watching. I'm watching. What's Freddie your next concert that you're going to? Yeah. Wow. Funny enough, I think it might be Billie Eilish with my son. I love Billie Eilish. Dude, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm total. Too. I've been a fan from. See, he got me into her, but that's probably my next show is Billie Eilish with, with Brandon. So uh, that's great. The last one I went right before COVID. The last right before COVID, I went to. I, I thought it was an incredible show. I went to see Hall and Oates in the Garden right before COVID it hit hard. Oh, did Hall Squeeze Oates, open up that show? What? Squeeze, squeeze open. In, when I say with a capital I, incredible. I'm talking yeah. about it sounded like a fucking record. It was so good. Talk about a night. It was my. It was our anniversary, which just so happened to me. We talk about a night you just have with your with your, your girl, your wife, my wife. It was just a great night to have two great bands that sounded like fucking everything you wanted them to sound like. Who's playing and, keyboards for them now? Uh, it was the guy playing. Wasn't it one in Daryl's house? Uh, the guy, the dude that's playing in Daryl's house. Because 
I mean, if you remember, Squeeze had two all time keyboard players. They had Juice Holland. I thought you talked about Darren. I, I, talk I thought you talked about Whole Notes. No, no, I'm talking about um, uh, Squeeze because I cause Squeeze is one of these bands that I never think get enough credit. No way, dude. How, those songs are incredible, dude. Just go go listen to the best of Squeeze right now. Anybody who hasn't, please listen to Squeeze. I was How supposed to go up. see Whole Notes and Squeeze on my birthday in August last year. But see, here's the thing, Frank. I bought a house three minutes away from Starland Ballroom. Oh, I'm trouble. 15 minutes away from PNC Bank Art Center. Woo. And my birthday's August 13th. And it was 99 degrees. And I'm still 350 pounds. So I decided, hey, you know what? Air conditioning, pizza, and weed is a lot better than fucking dying on my birthday. I got you. I got you. It was, it was an awesome show, though. And then I saw my first show out of uh, COVID was the Fruit Fighters, the Garden. Awesome. Oh, it was amazing. One of the best awesome. shows I ever went to. I, I loved it. I loved it. I was a fan. Excuse me. <coughs> my allergies are killing me. Um, I was I was screaming at the top of my lungs every song at that yep. Foo Fighters show. It was like one of those times. It was right before the, the Delta yep. hit, right? So everybody's feeling good. You can take off your mask and stuff. Everybody was feeling good. Man, um, it was just one of those great vibes in that it show. It was an amazing vibe at that show yeah. because it was Love like, it. you know, it, whatever side of the fence you play on with, with the, the, you know, the masking and the vaccinations and stuff yeah, like that, matter, yeah. everybody was vaccinated at the show. Yeah. So you mm-hmm. knew you were kind of safe. And this is like kind of before you realized, like, if, look, I got the shot. I'm, I'm, I'm safe. Like now you don't realize you can still get it because I, I, I'm triple fucking shot it. I got, I fucking dying for four days in the beginning of the month. You know what I mean? Wow. But, uh, I remember just sitting there and they opened up with best of you oh, and I just, the waterworks, we were, yeah. we were just, wa- the waterworks were happening. Full it was emotion. just one of those unbelievable experiences. Yeah. It was like letting it all out from the first mm-hmm. song. I remember from that. I was like, fuck yeah. I just, I didn't, yeah. it didn't matter. It was just, yes. And thank you. It was really, thanks Dave. That was fucking yeah. awesome. Where were your seats, by the way? I want to see if I had better I had seats. Than you. I had load seats. Um, yes. I had better really? seats. Than you. <laughs> you probably did. But I had load seats, uh, and they they would just I saw everything I wanted to see. They weren't they weren't amazing. Perfect. They weren't too close, not too far. It was great. Yeah, perfect I just show. To be a fan, you know, just just a fan of yep. watching a show. I think that's really important not to lose that. And they actually just released that show. I don't know if you saw this, but for New Year's Eve, yeah. uh, Dave Grohl put a post up and says, "I know a lot of people are staying home because of COVID and everything. Here's a show for you guys to watch." And it was that concert, and they put it on YouTube free for everybody. And then how about when they brought out um um. For creep, um, the fuck Dave Chappelle. Uh, Chappelle. Dave Chappelle, dude. When he came out, it was just so balls out. It was so balls out. Him yeah. just taking it over. He owned that fucking stage. I, oh, I yeah. loved it. And I, I have a friend who texts me and goes, "I can't believe Chappelle came out." And it was before Chappelle came out. Apparently, the set list leaked like an hour before, and the oh, really? dick went on Twitter. And he was like, "Oh, I can't believe Chappelle's playing Creep." And I'm like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" And five minutes later, he starts walking out. I'm like, "You son of a bitch!" I was so pissed. You I shouldn't was so be on hot. your phone at a concert, John. Yeah. What's that? You shouldn't be on your phone at a concert. <laughs> Well, yeah, your, your, your phone goes in your po- pocket. Well, I was supposed to have my, my lighter out, Jeff. No, my no, out, no, I don't, like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I don't do the lighter. I don't do the phone. Frick. No, you know me. I don't, you know, power ballad. That's when I go to the bathroom. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was just an awesome fun, night. Man. This was a lot of fun. Frankie, tell people how they can get the book. You can get Frank Bello, brothers, fathers, brothers, and sons on Amazon. You can go right now to get Amazon. And you can also get it a signed copy at rarebirdlit.com. You can go on my go to my social media. You can go to my uh, Instagram, go to my uh, my profile, it'll give you all the information. There's a link there. You could do that at the Frank Bello. Perfect. Yeah, maybe man. Adam could also do like a, a link uh, when he uh, edits this show and he can put it on here so people can go right in uh, and pick it up. That'd be great. How cool would that be to get like a signed copy of this book? That's cool. Yeah. So they have that and, and go to the link. You can get it there. So it's, it's kind of cool. People are really digging that too. I saw so many of them. It's awesome. Are you I doing any it. type of book promotion where you go into like to the bookstores? And we get started to before Omicron. We started to do, I did a couple of appearances. I did, you know, cause I was doing a couple of songs. I brought an acoustic guitar. I uh, did one in Detroit and did one in um, New England. It was great. Uh, and then this Omicron thing started. What, what we want to do when things settle down, it seems like they are soon, sooner yes. than later, mm-hmm. I hope. We're, we're looking to uh, start going out there again, doing some more promotion. 
Awesome. That'd be great, man. I really do encourage people to check out this book. Like I said, it, you. you know, it you, you you don't expect that from a guy who's in anthrax, but he really <laughs> puts it all on on the table, and it it's it, it's a very easy read. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Thank you for that very much. Yeah. All right, man. Uh, Frank, we can't thank you enough. I mean, this, me too, this, dude. This, I this love this. This is like hanging out with the boys. This is awesome. And that's, that's what we love about it. You know, that's what we love about. It. We've had. We've had some amazing guests like yourself and we had Rob Caggiano on before oh, and Bruce Kubelik well, well, from well. Kiss and everything. And you guys are the best. And we find out that the people who are like nobodies are the real biggest dicks that we've ever had on the show. <laughs> so the bigger the name is, the better the fucking guests are with yeah. the show, which I love. It's just fun, dude. You got to be you. You got to be human, exactly. man. It's a, you know, it's it just be be yourself, really. That's what life's about. Absolutely. But we thank you. Uh, Thanks, uh, we will guys. be back hopefully next week. Mike. Do you have anyone on the horizon for us, buddy? Uh, we're going to just have Frank Bello back and do an hour, but with his Paul Stanley impression. Yes, we could do that. All right. <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ. By the way, I get, listen, people, how you doing? We can do I'm gonna, a whole bunch of it. Yeah, I'm going to send you uh, the um, Paul Stanley GPS, and you'll have a blast laughing at that. It's just Paul Stanley it. being GPS. I'm a big fan, obviously, you know that. So I'm all, I'm all ready for that. Yes. Uh, nobody booked yet, but we're working on it. Very cool. I'm all in. Oh, okay, well, we'll get, get to work, Mike. And thank you for, for hooking this up with us. And, fr- and Frank, we can't thank you enough. Thanks and, for having me, guys. Uh, it's fun. I had a ball with you guys. Thank we'll you for having me. see you guys soon. It's a pleasure. Take thank care, you so much. Peace.